The focus will be uh, cardiomyopathies, mostly uh, infectious, inflammatory, however you like to call it. Uh, we have also a great panel, uh, Dr. Liao, Dr. Trivieri, and Dr. Kukar, who will be through Zoom. And we have a great moderator, Dr. Handley. So I think we'll get in uh, because we have a lot of uh, things to discuss with him. Uh, Solomon. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. We have a great case today. Just for the panelists, we're going to have some images from different modalities. We'll ask for your interpretation. We also have some audience response questions this time around, so I hope everyone can get their cell phones ready. So if you want to look at the lower left of this slide, for those of you joining us remotely, you can see the link there, and that's how you can access, access the audience response questions. After we get our feedback from the audience, we'll ask the panelists to weigh in as well. And then we're planning to have some time at the end for Q&A. So I do ask that the audience hold their comments if possible until the end. And I promise that we'll give you time. And this is truly a uh, system-wide conference. So for those of you joining us from other Mount Sinai institutions, feel free to chat me in the Zoom link. And I will try to ask your questions to the panelists at the end. Take it away, Saul. All right, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Hadley. So welcome, everyone, to Multimodality Imaging Conference. Again, I'm Solomon, one of the Chief Cardiology Fellows. And uh, future advanced cardiac imaging fellows next year. Um, and exactly as Dr. Hadley mentioned, if everyone could just take out their phones, go to polev.com forward slash solomonbeanstock321. We're going to have uh, some audience response questions. All right, so let's get started with the case. This is the one-liner. Patient's a 52-year-old female with a history of syncope and COVID-19 infection that was very mild in January of 2022, who presents to the Mount Sinai Hospital in April 2022, so three months later, uh, with VT on 24-hour Holter monitor. So a little bit about the history of present illness in this patient. So the patient went to uh, her primary care doctor in April for a general checkup. She was found to have an abnormal EKG. She hadn't had one before and was sent for an echo. The outside echo showed an EF of 40% with quote-unquote wall motion abnormalities. She was also sent for a 24-hour monitor for um, palpitations that were endorsed. But otherwise, she was really asymptomatic uh, using a stationary bicycle 30 minutes a day, three times a week. So this is the Holter monitor, <clears throat> the 24-hour Holter monitor. As you can see, I have it highlighted here. She had a minute and 26 second run of ventricular tachycardia, which at this point, she just felt palpitations. In terms of other history about the patient, social history, she works in pharmaceutical marketing. She's a never smoker, drinks eight glasses of wine a week for the past 30 years. And she endorsed remote cocaine use in the 1980s. For family history, her mother uh, had CAD with a stent, a complete heart block with a pacemaker at the age of 83. She had no known drug allergies. And in terms of home medication, she was just on Ativan and Ambien as needed. This is her admission physical exam when she came to Sinai. Vital signs are really unremarkable. <clears throat> Afebrile, heart rate of 80, blood pressure 103 over 75, setting 97% on room air. The rest of the physical exam was completely unremarkable. Here are the emission labs, and again, very unremarkable, except for this borderline troponin I of 0.04. This was prior to the high sensitivity troponin assays that were available. They never repeated this uh, troponin either. In terms of more labs, they worked her up for you know, an inflammatory process, vasculitis, rheumatologic workup. And these labs were remarkable for a elevated CRP of 26, with a reference range of 0 to 5. ESR was normal, ANA was only weakly positive at one to 80, and notably the COVID antibody was very positive, greater than 50,000. This was her initial ECG on April 7, um, showing uh, sinus tachycardia, first degree AV block, 
and a right bundle branch block. Again, we had no EKGs to compare this to. All right, so this brings us to our first audience response question, if everyone could just go to poll everywhere. And given the information here, the patient just came to the hospital with this VT on the holter, what would you do next? Would you get a cardiac MRI? Would you do a cardiac cath? Would you get an echo to just further assess this? Or would you just say, okay, the patient had some palpitations and this you know, very long episode of VT, we're just gonna go ahead and put an ICD in. So please answer. So it looks like the majority feel echocardiogram is the best choice followed by cardiac catheterization panelists. What do you think? Well, I, I, I think this seems to be a reasonable first approach. Um, the patient is not hemodynamically unstable, so I don't think there's a need for urgent cardiac catheterization. Although ultimately in the workup of the etiology, you would want to consider to do that. But we don't need to, you know, proceed to a cardiac catheterization right away to decide whether or not the patient needs to have a balloon pump or any other, you know, uh, emergent shock intervention. She's likely not in shock at the present time. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, actually, when was she, when did she have the vaccine, you said? Oh, um, she, yeah, she was vaccinated uh, prior. Remote. Yeah. Remote history, and it was okay. prior to the episode that she had in so January. I think that's a reasonable first approach for me. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Maria. I mean, I think um, echo is uh, always going to be a very good choice for a first test. I mean, you can see regional wall motion. In this particular case, with the first degree and a right bundle, you can see what the RV size and function may look like. If there's an arrhythmia, you may be with that right bundle branch block, you're concerned about right sided columns, ARVC, stuff like that. And then I think whenever there's an arrhythmia, I think it's reasonable to exclude coronary disease, although in her case, it seems uh, significantly less likely that that's a possible etiology, but I think so reasonable to exclude. Yeah, I agree. I'm surprised, though, that people do catheterization before MRI in a case like this. This to me is surprising, very surprising. I think the VT, I think, is what drives the most of the... That's what the conference is for to teach them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what happened next? Time? All right, so just go back to the slides here. So the patient went for a <laughs> left heart cath right away <laughs> on April 7th. And uh, I guess it's not <laughs> as you can see here, really the coronaries were, were normal. Uh, you can see the LV gram in the bottom right here um, showing a decreased EF with really diffuse wall motion abnormalities. Um, and this was the report. So the LVEDP was 12, going to what Dr. Trivieri mentioned, a normal angiogram, mildly hypokinetic uh, ventricular gram with an EF of 40% that was estimated. Can I add something? Yes. So if you go ahead and do a left eye cat in this case, I think it would have been reasonable to also do a right eye cat, just in case, you know. Although, again, there was no evidence that she was in shock, but, you know, since you're going there, I think it would have been reasonable. And, and potentially consider at the same time if the MRI was done uh, a biopsy. So that would have been a more efficient way of using the cat lab time. Yeah. Terrific. All right. So the patient underwent an echo the next day on April 8th. Um, so we have these images. We have some images coming up after. Uh, we have our uh, echo expert here, Dr. Liao. Um, Dr. Liao, if you could just review these images and let us know what you think. Well, Dr. Goldman is here too, so uh, if Dr. Goldman has anything to say, please say, of course. Um, so it looks like um, parasternal views here, and maybe a little bit of fat pad in the anterior, but no effusion. I think that's important to mention here as well. Uh, function looks so far uh, globally decreased. It's hard to see some wall motion. The aortic and mitral valves look okay. Perhaps there's some thickening of the basal anterior septum over there, um, which is a little bit surprising uh, since this is person is not that old, if I remember right, right. 50s, yeah, uh, so that's perhaps a little bit um, unanticipated to find, uh, but aside from that, so far, that's the main finding here. Okay, so we have some more uh, images here, four chamber, two chamber, three chamber, both with and without ultrasound enhancing agents. Um, so yeah, I, doc, yeah. So I think here, um, starting again with the pericardium outside in, uh, looks okay. I don't see any effusion. 
Um, the right side uh, looks okay. I think that was one of the things I was curious about with the right bubble branch block. Um, so the RP size and function looks okay. Um, very clear on the contrast images and not so clear on the non-contrast images, which is a good point for fellows to observe, is that there is a significant wall motion abnormality there in the mid to basal, I guess, um, lateral wall, which looks akinetic, um, possibly aneurysmal there. Uh, also, you can see it on the three-chambered infralateral as well. Um, so definitely concerning finding there, uh, and especially in light of the normal angiogram that we just saw, uh, that would be that would need to be explained somehow. Um, interestingly, Dr. Goldman often talks about perfusion of the myocardium, and uh, if you look at those areas where the, where there is a kinesis of that segmental wall motion, it does not look like it's perfusing or enhancing with the contrast agent. Um, I don't know if you agree. I think the other area is infraceptal mm -hmm. area on the four chain review. Oh, yeah. So, and you have the apex sort of uh, mm -hmm. contracting better. So, when you have multiple areas and normal coronaries, you know, think of myocarditis, some type of uh, inflammatory process mm -hmm. which is affecting multiple areas. You know, it could have been multiple uh, vest multi vessel coronary disease, but since you excluded that. I think, you know, it would be a good idea, you know, Dr. Maracas, maybe uh, just expand on the, you know, on the decision about cath versus, you know, echo as a teaching point. When would you go to, you know, the imaging first? When would you go to cath first? Yes, I mean, uh, I think with this patient, you know, uh, echo most likely would have been the, I would anticipate to have a like 100% answer that would be echo first. On the patient that is, uh, I mean, it looks stable. I mean, he had uh, some VT, but uh, it looks stable. There was no indication to go straight to the the cath lab uh, first. But uh, so my case would have been 100% echo. But uh, after that, uh, I agree. I mean, at some po this uh, with this whole motion abnormalities, of course you want to, and the VT, of course you want to rule out. Uh, coronary artery disease, uh, even if uh, the likelihood was low. And uh, so I think it's the discussion is uh, after echo to do cath or uh, MRI for a more definite uh, information. But I think most likely on this young patient with uh, regional hormonal abnormalities, MRI most likely will have uh, given uh, after as a second uh, test will have given uh, more definite uh, information, but I don't think we could avoid having that the cuff on this on this case. Yeah, no, the question was whether or not to do it in combination with the right eye cap and the biopsy. Um, the other thing is that the regional wall motion abnormality that we see, um, again, doesn't seem to fit with also the elevation interpoint, which was really mild. So you're thinking more, even if it was a myocarditis, are likely to be acute to some extent. There is some component of chronicity to that. Um, and uh, also a presentation was not in keeping with an acute uh, sort of syndrome. I think also um, some coronary assessment or assessment of the coronary arteries would be important for me. I don't necessarily know that a cardiac cath would be, you know, the way to do it. I mean, I think it's obviously a, a very good way, the gold standard way to do it. I think if you were to think about doing cardiac CT, that might be reasonable as well, uh, since the pattern of this wall motion seems a little bit uh, strange for coronary disease. Um, you know, other modalities to assess for coronary disease, like uh, perfusion imaging or stress echo, might be a little bit more challenging um, given the obvious resting perfusion and wall motion abnormalities on this echo. Also, the VT on this, I mean. And the VT, right. All right, thank you, everyone. That was great. Just moving on. This is the echo report, exactly what, what you all mentioned. Um, so a few days later, after that, around three days later, the patient underwent the cardiac MRI that we were discussing. Um, this is a short axis stack from base to apex. We have some more cardiac MR images in the following slides. We have our cardiac imaging expert, Dr. Kukar, on the line. Uh, Dr. Kukar, if you could just review the images and let us know what you think. 
Uh, yeah, of course. Um, and I agree with everything that was said, just in terms of wall motion abnormality in the setting of VT definitely necessitated <laughs> some kind of coronary workup. I think someone posed a question about coronary CT. I think that could have been reasonable as well, but I think in the setting of the ventricular arrhythmia, um, that's what we do best. So um, this is a short axis cine. Um, so this is a non-contrast image where we're doing relatively eight millimeter short thin slices down the LV. Um, and basically starting from the top left, that's a basal, a basal shot. And as we keep going down, we're getting towards the mid LV and the apex. Um, so as you can see in the second shot on the top, you can see some basal infraceptal abnormality. And as we're going down to the bottom, the bottom left, you can see the basal, uh, the mid infralateral wall is definitely near akinetic and it's thinned out. Um, so certainly I would say this is globally uh, decreased, but also with significant wall motion abnormalities um, as described on the echocardiogram. So this is the, the four chamber cine. Um, actually, there were there was not a two or three chamber cine. Um, uh, Dr. Kukar, what do you think about uh, this shot? Yeah, perfect. So um, again, you can see that this is um, <clears throat> moderately decreased, I would say, mild moderately decreased DF. And for those of you in the room, the fellows who might not be as familiar with MRI, um, essentially this would be also looked at as a four chamber just on the echocardiogram where on the right side, you can see that's the anterolateral wall. And to Dr. Liao's point, you can see that this is kind of an unusual wall motion abnormality that you would expect for a typical CAD. This is more kind of in the mid anterolateral wall where it's localized um, wall motion abnormality. So probably say near akinesis of this mid anterolateral wall. Normal RV, completely normal RV. Yes, agree, normal RV and exactly, so good point. So the RV is not dilated there's no focal akinesis or dyskinesis that would suggest kind of more of an ARVC pattern. Um, so this looks more focused on the on the LV with regional wall motion abnormality. Terrific. Um, I just wanted to include uh, the four chamber echo shot here with uh, that's contrast enhanced, just to show how similar uh, the two modalities can really be. Uh, I just thought this was interesting. It's almost as good as the <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so here's the LGE, so uh, contrast uh, shots, so two chamber, four chamber, and three chamber. Dr. Kukar, what do you think? Um, interesting. <laughs> so, I mean, on the left side, so basically when you're looking for delayed enhancement, you're really looking for patterns of enhancement. Um, so whether that's subendocardial, midmyocardial, or subepicardial. Um, this is interesting because it's a little difficult for me to tell just on that, uh, on the left side, on the two chamber, uh, whether it kind of spares a subendocardium on the anterior side. Certainly in the mid anterior and the mid inferior portion of this LV, you can see that there's um, significant enhancement. Definitely the inferior wall is sparing the subendocardial border. That's a mid myocardial pattern of enhancement. Um, also looks like there's something um, lighting up towards the apex. If you go to the second shot uh, in the middle, uh, right where we saw that focal wall motion abnormality on the anterolateral wall, you can clearly see there's delayed enhancement um, that's sparing the subendocardial wall. So this is a mid myocardial pattern um, of enhancement, which has a broad differential that I'm sure we will go through. Um, interestingly, I mean, at the apex, I'd have to maybe see a little bit more whether that's actually something that's more punctate that looks like uh, something subendocardial, but I would say a broad pattern would be this is a mid myocardial pattern of fibrosis um, and kind of a diffuse distribution, which has this broad differential that we'll go through. And let me just get to the right side. So again, on the right side, you can see this infralateral wall actually looks extremely thin, um, almost looks near transmural uh, in that mid infralateral wall um, on this three chamber shot. But again, you have the coronary uh, path, which obviously demonstrates that there's no significant CAD in that territory. Um, so, you know, I think it was good that we definitely did a coronary evaluation just to exclude CAD in this situation. Terrific. Um, 
So this is the LGE now at short axis slices from base to apex. And um, Dr. Kukar, what do you think? Yeah, so again, I think now you can kind of clearly see this, um, you know, it's, it's near transmural, um, looks like it's sparing the subendocardium in, this, in some segments, but certainly also involving the subepicardial wall um, on the inferior septum on the left. Um, you can see an inferior lateral wall and the anterior lateral wall and the mid inferior wall on, in the middle section that this is near transmural fibrosis. Again, um, pretty extensive um, LGE in this section. And um, again, on this anterior wall, um, you've got this mid myocardial sub FD pattern um, as well. So, you know, it's in this section, I'll be honest, just looking at it for the first time, it looks like you know, it's not clear to me that it spares a subendocardium at all, but obviously someone looked at this case uh, <laughs> more thoroughly um, with all the images. So I would say this is a pretty extensive pattern of enhancement that looks sub epi and mid myocardial, um, you know, in the setting of regional wall motion abnormalities. So do you want me to talk about a differential at this point or should we wait for your next slide? Yeah, let's, uh, I think, we had a, yeah, let's wait a little bit. We have some more. Okay. Oh, so, so yep. I wanted to also add that, uh, you know, obviously I don't talk about differential diagnosis, but uh, because of the combination of the pattern that seems to be, you know, to some extent, uh, transmural, sub epicardia, you know, an embolic event is also something that should be in the differential. Like, I, 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 but the patient didn't have any obvious uh, uh, clot in the LD that we saw. Um, but a procoagulable state would also be, should be considered. So agree, definitely. The only thing I would say is that typically on MRI, at least, um, if it's embolic, it tends to be extremely punctate and focal. Um, with something like this, where there's diffuse, um, extensive patchy involvement, I'd expect something a little bit more, um, more extensive. But certainly at the apex, actually, if you look at the apical shot on the right, if you look at that apical anterior wall, if I just saw that, um, I definitely wouldn't exclude um, embolic phenomenon for that particular position. I think in the setting of the extensive kind of patchy sub epi mid myocardial enhancement, um, just with Occam's razor, my first concept, my first thought would still be to look for a unifying diagnosis. Yeah, my impression so far is that the um, extent of LGE is a lot more than I anticipated seeing based upon the wall motion. It seems a lot more extensive and a lot more Transmural. I was sort of expecting that at the lateral wall, and as, I, as Dr. Colton pointed out, the basal septal wall there on the echo. Uh, but the anterior inferior here is, also has significant involvement on that mid slice, and a little bit surprised to see that to that, that extent. The other thing with MRI, uh, as it's good, we have to focus, uh, you know, and they are not here the, on the HST images, you know, you can see if the person has lymphadenopathy, which also sometimes can help uh, with the differential diagnosis. And I know we don't show the HST images here, but uh, that's another good thing with MRI. You can uh, associate diagnosis based the, on uh, extra cardiac findings. Yeah, and the other thing would be any areas of edema, if there were specific sequences for that. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll go. Oh, you got to. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here we have our next poll everywhere slide. Let me just... Go to the next question here. All right, so what other useful information can you get from cardiac MRI? Uh, A, extracellular volume, B, native T1 mapping, C, T2 weighted imaging, D, T2 mapping, E, all of the above, which somebody answered prior to me even putting the slide up. Oh, this is a very advanced question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the native T1 mapping and the extracellular volume. It just uh, seem to be abnormal all the time, so I, I don't know whether I would give you a lot of information necessarily. But so. yeah, I think uh, all these techniques are very useful uh, to point out, uh, you know, towards the direction of uh, diagnosis. But I agree, it's very tedious, and uh, for the people who do this all the time. Uh, is sometimes it's very difficult, you know, because the numbers uh, can be so close together and still be abnormal. So it's a very tedious. But I think the reason that we're doing this conference is that we have to put everything together, you know. I mean, right, if you right. decide on one factor only, 
most likely you will uh, misdiagnose the case, but if uh, all the parameters they point towards uh, you know one diagnosis, that most likely would be the accurate right. diagnosis. And sometimes even with all this, we still cannot tell in the end what is the you know and we start a biric therapy. So, but all these are very helpful and yeah. advanced imaging. That's why it's called advanced imaging. Uh, the final thing I would say is that you know the, the, the diagnoses that we may be considering in our minds right now are often quite arrhythmogenic. And so you might get a lot of PVCs during acquisition, and I'm sure Dr. Hadley um, is aware that the, there are a lot of arrhythmias during image acquisition for MRI that can degrade the image quality. So far on the CINES, it looks pretty good, um, but especially in the T1 and T2 images, I think that will make the images quite blurry and difficult to quantify. But if you were to choose, probably the one that I would go for right now would be the T2 weighted image, yeah, exactly. you know. But obviously, you would have to consider also the other. But it's probably the most informative because it gives you an, it would give you an idea about the acuity. Although we speculate it's not that acute as a presentation. Saul, can you tell us more about these parameters for the fellows? Yes, absolutely. So we'll get into to all of this. So one of these parameters is T2-weighted imaging that we'll talk more about. But Dr. Kukar, uh, what are your thoughts on this image? Um, of T2-weighted imaging looking for edema that we'll talk more about. Yeah, so um, definitely, if I had to answer that question, I would also say all of the above. Obviously, we never <laughs> want to choose, but T2 is always very helpful. Um, so we look for T2-weighted imaging to evaluate for the presence of myocardial edema. Um, obviously, now we also have mapping techniques where we can kind of better quantitate, but kind of just visually here. Um, we're looking for hyperintensity um, in the myocardial signal. And I do think in this infralateral wall, uh, there is some hyperintensity of that infralateral wall, if you could point it out, thank you, um, compared to the rest of the myocardium, um, where, you know, and again, on the anterior wall, it's a little difficult to tell if that's kind of involving the, uh, just the trabeculations, possibly it's up there. Um, but certainly I would say there's, there's visual hyperintensity of the infralateral wall that's suggestive of um, possible edema. Terrific. Um, so this was the, the read of the MRI, exactly what everyone was saying, moderate resting systolic dysfunction, mid to apical infralateral walls, aneurysmal, thin, dyskinetic, and there was this significant diffuse patchy scarring of approximately 45% of the total myocardial volume in a non-coronary distribution, um, which we, we talked about. So something that Dr. Kukar mentioned and something that we talked about in the slide was TD1 and T2 mapping. So we actually have a pre-contrast native T1 map here from the patient and then a T2 map. Uh, Dr. Kukar, if you could just take us through these images. Yeah, sure. So um, T1 and T2 uh, are quantitative mapping is definitely a fairly new technique. Um, it is field strength dependent. So it does depend if you're imaging on a 1.5 or a 3T. Um, there are also local reference ranges, um, but in general, you know, when we're talking about kind of evaluation of things like an possible inflammatory cardiomyopathy, um, you know, one of the differential considerations is also myocarditis. And so then we think about the Lake Louise criteria and we're looking for kind of a T1 value and a T2 value, both of which tend to be higher um, in these processes. So what they do here is they're kind of looking at the pre-contrast, what we call a native T1 um, as you have delineated, and we get a region of interest um, where we're able to kind of calculate the native T1 value. Um, and on the right side, again, you're looking at, instead of us just visually looking at something, something I tell my fellows is kind of like visually looking at mitral regurgitation versus trying to quantify it with PISA techniques. Um, this is certainly that a little bit more accurate um, just in terms of your a local reference ranges, but also maybe even in terms of other comparison to other parts of the myocardium um, that might look normal. So we use these to kind of better quantify uh, what our eyes are looking at um, and kind of get something that's maybe more accurate and can kind of give us a sense um, of whether there truly is like what degree of edema. This also might be used by the way, also in terms of following an inflammatory process to see a reduction in edema. Uh, generally on the right side, you know, if you have a T2 map, um, you know, with edema, you basically have an expansion of the interstitial space. 
Um, so these techniques, in, in addition to like the hematocrit, can also be used to calculate ECV uh, extracellular volume and give you a better sense of what's going on. Dr. Kukar, thanks. And to your point about reference ranges, on this scanner, both of these parameters are above the upper limit of normal. Makes sense, based on what we saw. What do you mean? So, we'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, uh, so, parametric mapping, T1 to T2 mapping, Dr. Kukar mentioned a lot of the stuff, but it really reflects uh, additional tissue characterization and, um, as Dr. Hadley calls it, a virtual biopsy. So T1 map is a pixel-wise quantification of the relaxation time after a radio frequency pulse. So the pre-contrast that native T1 time that we saw lengthens with interstitial expansion caused by edema, infarction, amyloid infiltration, and fibrosis. And it shortens, it gets smaller in the presence of fat and iron accumulation. As you can see in the figure below here, it kind of helps us try to figure out diagnoses. The T2 map is specific for increased myocardial water content and is used as an index of myocardial edema as we discussed. And a little bit about that extracellular volume. So the extracellular volume uh, fraction comprises the interstitial and intravascular space. The formula we see on the, on the top here relies on the change in T1 relaxation rate before and after contrast. So fibrosis and infiltration bind gadolinium contrast avidly, and that increases post-contrast T1 times and thereby increases the ECV. Hemochromatosis, which involves oxidized iron, and Fabrase, which involves fat accumulation and deposition, don't bind contrast avidly. That leads to a decreased post-contrast T1 time you see here and a decreased ECV. And that could be helped in a, you know, that can help with a, uh, pointing out a diagnosis as well, especially as normal ECV has been shown to rule out myocardial damage with a high degree of certainty. And so this is uh, the diagnostic utility of this tissue characterization. The Y-axis has the native T1 values, so that's the pre-contrast. The x-axis has the extracellular volume, and this allows for discrimination of various forms of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So if you see a low T1 value and a low ECV, you're thinking more Fabry and iron, which is hemochromatosis, as we talked about. Whereas if you have high both, it's a, maybe an acute MI, amyloid, and you know, a, acute myocarditis is here as well. So this is, can be very helpful uh, diagnostically. And this is something that Dr. Kukar mentioned, which was the uh, 2018 updated Lake Louise criteria, which is a diagnostic criteria for any type of myocarditis. And the main criteria, which you need both of, involves the myocardial edema that you see on T2 mapping and T2-weighted imaging that we discussed, as well as non-ischemic myocardial injury, which can be abnormal T1 times or T1 map, ECV, or late gadolinium enhancement. Um, so all of these things go into the diagnostic criteria. There are supportive criteria uh, involving pericarditis and systolic LV dysfunction, uh, but I thought this was interesting. So back to the case, and as Dr. Trivieri mentioned, where's the right heart cath? Where's the biopsy? So here it is. Two days after the MRI, they go in and they do a right heart cath and endomyocardial biopsy. They actually went back and forth about whether to do a voltage gated biopsy in this scenario. Uh, they involved DP and, and, and Dr. Harnick and Dr. Dukapati were involved but they decided that the yield would probably be similar in both, so they just went ahead with a, a standard uh, endomyocardial biopsy. But you know the, the filling pressures appear normal here, the cardiac index appears uh, normal as well, and unfortunately, the biopsy came back uh, really unrevealing. Myocardial tissue with no significant histologic abnormalities, no inflammatory cell infiltrates or granulomas were seen. Yeah. They didn't say, they didn't they didn't say where they were biopsying. I mean, because the MRI, that in the ventricular septum at the mid to basal section seemed pretty transmural, and perhaps if they went for that area, they might have perhaps seen something, but I'm just not sure what, what if they were biopsying the RV free wall, I think we didn't see any, any abnormality there on the MRI. Yeah, they mentioned that they biopsied the septum, which was interesting because there was so much LGE there uh, that we were surprised that there, you know, it didn't really yield a diagnosis here either. All right, so the biopsy is negative. What would you do next? So let me just pull this up. So what would you do next? A, nothing, just wait for the viral myocarditis to resolve. B, start steroids. C, get a PET-MR. D, genetic testing. Or E, none of the above, maybe something else. What do you think, what do you think at this point is going on? 
that's the question because you can start doing testing, you're presenting one test after the other. <laughs> but what is your way of thinking though? Yeah, should, should we ask the panelists yeah. where, the, where they are at the moment? What yeah. about the uh, arrhythmia? Has the patient had further arrhythmias at this point? So that's a great uh, question. So nothing sustained, but runs of NSVT on telly. And on the 12 lead, did they check to see where they thought the origin of the PVCs were? Not that I could see in the notes. Yeah. Not that I could see. <clears throat> But again, um, at this point, in, in my opinion, differential diagnosis still would remain uh, uh, myocarditis, um, which again, you know, it depends on the etiology. It's unlikely to be post-COVID, uh, given the fact that the vaccination was very remote. And for the most, um, I mean, for the case series that I've seen, the majority occurred within one month from vaccination, usually within a few days from vaccination. So that's unlikely to be the case. Uh, could be again a viral myocarditis of some sort, which is more in the resolving stage. Um, I mean, in the biopsy, they weren't able to see any evidence of that, so uh, or no evidence of also giant cell myocarditis, with, which would have been in the differential diagnosis. So I don't think there is a, a strong indication to start steroids. I, I would wonder whether or not we should rule out a proparguable state in this patient. Um, because again, sometimes I've seen patients with uh, lupus anticoagulant having a similar presentation to that. Um, and, and I think it would be easy to do with just a blood uh, test. Um, and then, you know, sarcoidosis would definitely be in the differential, although there isn't anything right now that's pointing aside from the DT to sarcoidosis. She doesn't have a lot of lung involvement that we see uh, she doesn't have an, any other feature of sarcoidosis, um, so no lymphadenopathy, nothing really that, you know, suggests sarcoidosis. So it could be still a case of isolated cardiac sarcoid. Uh, obviously, I am biased. I think the PET MRI would be important because it would give us some information as to whether or not there is anything acute for which we could consider, um, you know, uh, initiating steroids. But the diagnosis at this point, I, I don't know whether it's that clear to me. I would think more of, uh, you know, a myocarditis of some Can sort. So this was in the context of COVID? Yeah, so the patient had COVID in January of 2022. Yeah. Very mild, never went to the hospital, resolved spontaneously. And then three months later had uh, this episode of VT on the holder. So the antibody level was very high. It was high. very right. high. The spike antibody level was very, very high. Yeah. Because... You know, and this has been described by you guys, is just injury. You don't need myocarditis. Yeah. In fact, when you look at all the data from this institution on troponin and echo, you find out that 30% had abnormal yeah, abnormalities true. on echo and don't necessarily is myocarditis. So the fact that biopsy is negative, to me, the first thing to think about, it, again, I can be wrong, but would be just injury. Just injury, yeah. Due to the nothing else without necessarily slight myocarditis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And it, you know, there is also some work that we have done in long COVID, which this patient doesn't seem to typically have, where we have seen pattern of myocarditis without any acute inflammatory changes. So, but it, again, it's nothing that appears to be acute at the present time. So definitely, I will not start steroids. The question is, having the tool of the PET MRI, would you go ahead and do it, just so if you're sure that uh, you know it, there is nothing acute in favor of an acute component, which could potentially you could treat with steroids, was the evidence of edema on the T2-weighted sequences. That would be the only thing for which you would think about uh, potentially using steroids to treat that myocarditis. Um, so. Yeah, I think I think. Uh... You know, if this was acute uh, myocarditis, I mean, the, with this amount of uh, uh, interstitial fibrosis, the patients who have been uh, very sick, I mean, I know it has VT, but uh, hemodynamically she's stable, so this is uh, a large amount of uh, scar right. for a patient who presents, uh, I mean, she has some VT on the, so, and sarcoidosis also, and sarcoidosis, I don't think it's a typical case of sarcoidosis because I mean, you don't see, you see scar, but not so, uh, so much scar. So I think uh, uh, what Dr. Fuster say is, uh, is most likely correct, maybe related to the, to the COVID, but uh, 
I think most likely the person deserves uh, more evaluation. If, yeah. I think just for the fellows, typically when we think of myocarditis, we think of linear intramyocardial and epicardial enhancement. And not typically this degree of transmural um, a late dead lineum enhancement. For a sarcoid, we typically think of granular kind of basal anterior inferolateral septum, uh, basal anterior septum and inferoseptum, uh, typical location, which leads to the conduction abnormality. Uh, that can be transmural, I think, in my experience, based upon the severity of the sarcoid. Uh, so, in my opinion so far, I think perhaps. A severe myocarditis like giant cell theoretically could lead to you know the transmurality of the late gadolinium enhancement, although clinically she doesn't seem particularly as sick as one would expect for giant cell. Uh, and then sarcoid, I think, is in the differential as well, um, based upon her first degree AV block that she had on the EKG in the right bundle. Uh, certainly some conduction abnormalities in addition to the arrhythmia. Right. I, I... Oh, go ahead. So the involvement of the septum. The other thing that I want to uh, emphasize is the fact that she had what looks like more scar mediated VT. So, um, well, like monomorphic anyway. What's cool, Gar? Uh, no, I, I agree. And I think the, you know, the myocardial biopsy just, and Dr. Trivieri is definitely more of an expert on that. Um, definitely has a pretty low diagnostic yield. So I'm not as swayed by it. Um, I think the presentation is actually um, quite suggestive of sarcoid, just in terms of the classic kind of regional wall motion abnormalities, not in the distribution of coronary disease and the setting of extensive um, delayed enhancement. And um, sarcoid can do so many things on MRI. Uh, it really is classic, as Dr. Liao said, in terms of the septal and the lateral wall, um, but certainly it can do anything. And then a young patient with the uh, right bundle kind of at baseline, um, just the whole kind of clinical picture. The other thing that's swaying me just kind of away from really acute myocarditis is this degree of LVEF reduction with enhancement with a low troponin. Um, of 0.04 and then the mild COVID, like if she had perhaps taken a big hit with the COVID infection that led to this degree, I would typically expect, and I know there are a lot more uh, experts in the room just in terms of the post-COVID response, but just in terms of other kind of myocarditis, um, I'd expect her to have at least presented in a more acute, um, unstable fashion. So I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards possible sarcoid, maybe with some kind of acute component of, I guess it's just about patients can have uh, other things, maybe there's an acute flare up of it, or there's a small acute myocarditis on top of it. But I, I certainly think that that uh, would be very beneficial in this situation. Great discussion. I know we're getting to the end here. Saul, can you take us to our last modality? Yep. <clears throat> so the patient did undergo a PET-MR a few days later on, on the 15th. So Dr. Trevieri. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> So we did the PET MRI. So you are seeing here some superimposed images of delayed gadolinium enhancement and FDG PET. Um, and uh, on the right side, you see an ACE view where you can actually take a look at the lung uh, as well as part of the heart. And usually we use that view to see whether or not there's any lymphadenopathy with the uh, FDG uptake. Um, and in scrolling through, I didn't see much uh, in the chest. And that's usually very useful because sometimes we can see with PET some lymph nodes that were not apparent on other modality, which could be target of biopsy. Uh, there was nothing really that could be easily approached or that was large enough to be visualized. Normally, and we are not showing that now, I do see a lot of uh, lymphadenopathy, a lot of FDG uptake. Um, and then uh, in the middle and left panel, you see more of the basal and mid view of the ventricle with, the, again, superimposed LGD and FDG PET. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I was somewhat skeptical looking at the story because, uh, you know, yeah, you're right. There are some components that suggest sarcoidosis, but not everything is really in keeping with sarcoidosis. And we are always very skeptical in diagnosing isolated cardiac sarcoid. 
but um, I would say that in looking at the pattern of FDG uptake, that to me was uh, almost diagnostic of sarcoidosis for what I've seen. Um, so this uh, sort of like, I, I call it the ag sign, uh, um, and it's probably more apparent with some images that uh, someone will show you, uh, but it's you know, this involvement of the basal uh, segment of the left ventricle at the site where the RV uh, sort of insert on the LV, um, you know, I've generally only seen in sarcoidosa. So looking at that pattern, more the left uh, slides, um, you know, I would say, I would have said that that was sarcoidosa. Um, and the reason I'm also saying that is because uh, if you look at a, a series that was published uh, a long time ago, uh, a large series in biopsy with sarcoidosis, sarcoidosis proven, um, there was always this involvement of the basal segment with the, uh, you know, this LG. And, uh, you know, with the, the FDG, we can essentially see uh, the same pattern, but with inflammation uh, in, in those segments. The other thing that this uh, scan tells you uh, is that there is an active inflammation, an active uh, process going on for which, you know, potentially the patient would benefit from treatment with steroids. But again, that is, to me, the tell sign uh, of sarcoidosis, which wasn't necessarily apparent from the story. I think I, I might just add for the fellows that you might more commonly see PET with CT rather than PET with MRI in the rest of the country. We're lucky here that we have Maria and Dr. Fayad um, using uh, their PET MR scanner. Uh, for PET CT, what you would want to do is to verify flow or perfusion to that area. So you could use rubidium or technetium. And again, you're looking for a mismatch between flow and FDG uptake. And that can help you identify what phase of sarcoid they're in. So if there's no flow and no FDG, then that might be the end stage, basically scar. And if there's FDG uptake but less flow, then that's progressive. And then early on, you might have both flow and FDG uptake, and that would be quite an early stage. Right. And I don't remember whether the biopsy was done before the PETMR, but technically looking at the PETMR, you could have used that modality to also guide the biopsy, because you can clearly see that in the inferior portion of the RV, there isn't much inflammation. So technically, they should have guided the, uh, the biotome toward the, LV, the RVOG, um, which I'm not sure they did. Yeah. The comments about sarcoid, actually, one is that today, Today, the, the guiding is critical because, you know, 50% of the biopsies are negative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but one question I have to you guys is, is the, the use of corticosteroids, just, as far as I know, we don't have any idea of what is the outcome when you see. I have patients with sarcoid and positive pets, and you have done them. Yeah. And I use corticosteroids according to that, but I'm not entirely sure where we go. Yeah, that, I, I mean, sarcoidosis remains really such a challenging diagnosis because we don't really know what dose of steroids to give. It's all very empiric uh, based on, you know, small studies. And we don't know whether we should give a combination of steroids and methotrexate. And there seems to be some data that suggests that if you start steroids early, you prevent RV dis uh, LV dysfunction and RV dysfunction, and there is some reversal. But the data is not that clear. So it's, and the other thing that I think it's very important is that there seem to be pattern of disease. So some patients that have a very aggressive course, regardless of what you do, they seem to still progress to uh, have a worse outcome. Uh, so I'm not entirely clear. It's not entirely clear. Nobody really knows for sure whether or not there's anything that is effective in treating um, how, this inflammation. How often you see isolated LV? I mean, isolated, some, some people believe that isolated uh, cardiac sarcoid doesn't exist uh, in the sense that it depends on the modality that you use. Uh, if you essentially were to be able to do a, pet, a whole body uh, PET FDG, you would see some evidence of inflammation somewhere else. Um, in, in, for us, you know, we are lucky because with the PET MR, we can see all the chest. We don't see, uh, you know, we don't see the head uh, and sarcoidosis you can also present uh, with involvement of the brain, but we do have a very good view of the chest. So I, I have seen, I would say, in 20% of cases, uh, I, what I would call isolated sarcoidosis. 
Sometimes, as I said, uh, lymphadenopathy is not apparent on other modality, and then you do the PET and you see some lymph node appearing you know, in the chest. So in that case, you would not necessarily call that isolated cardiac sarcoid. Uh, so it's a question of how deep you actually look for. But I would say that PET uh, should be the best way to look for any hidden you know, evidence of sarcoid. And just one final comment is about the expertise that we have here. It's important that you suppress the uh, myocardial uptake, the normal myocardial uptake of FTG before you attempt these scans. Otherwise, you'll get a bunch of false positives. And so there are a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and I think the one caveat about doing PET in a center that is not a center of excellence is that um, this, there's no standardized protocol for FTG uptake for cardiac sarcoid. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then the final thing about the treatment is that some people advocate using it to guide therapy to see if the FDG uptake reduces after um, steroids. I don't know, Maria, if you have any. Yeah, the, I mean, that was proposed by Birni. Uh, so, but again, it's not being proved by randomized clinical trial. There is no randomized clinical trial in treatment of cardiac sarcoidosis. But usually what people do, it's more of a consensus approach, uh, is they treat uh, with either steroids. They don't go more than 40 milligram. Uh, usually that's considered the highest dose that you give. Uh, and then you re-image in three months. If there's still persistence of inflammation on PET, you continue the treatment and you add a steroid sparing agent, typically it's methotrexate, and again, there's no randomized clinical trial. And then you do the same thing in three months. Um, uh, there are some clinical trials now looking at upfront combination therapy with methotrexate and steroids. Um, but again, it's all really based on consensus opinion. We, um, we don't know how long. The other thing about sarcoidosis is that everything is based on presence and absence. We don't have the middle ground. We don't know whether a patient is partially responding, somewhat responding, like everything we quantify is in absolute term, yes or no. Uh, we don't have the <coughs> non-invasive marker of sarcoidosis that we say, you know, that this patient is responding by 50%, so we can, we are on the right track. We, we don't have that, so, and that's obviously a, a, an issue, um, and it's difficult to get there. Thanks, everyone. It sounds like sarcoid has risen to the top of the differential for our panelists, although we're still pending final confirmation of biopsy. Um, Saul, can you bring us up to where we are now with this patient? Sure. So we talked about a, a differential diagnosis. We talked about giant cell myocarditis, a viral myocarditis. Was this COVID-19 related, uh, given that the patient had it and had a high um, antibody level, or is this sarcoid, which it is looking like it, it, it might be? <clears throat> so I'll just say quickly, giant cell myocarditis, again, is a histologic diagnosis. It hinges on this in the middle here, the endomyocardial biopsy, looking for these characteristic giant cells. The, you'll have elevated T1, elevated T2, and you'll have some LGE in that sub-epicardial region that's not ischemic, but again, it's pretty nonspecific. And talking about COVID-19 myocarditis, there was this excellent paper that, that came out in JAK Imaging in 2022, and our very own uh, Dr. Gina LaRocca was one of the co-authors on, where they looked at over 1,000 patients from 18 international sites of people with confirmed COVID-19 infection who underwent CMR, and they looked at the, the CMR patterns of myocardial injury. Most of the time, as Dr. Fuster, I think, you know, alluded to, you have this non-acute, non-ischemic pattern, around 13%. But around 8% of patients, you do have an acute myocarditis pattern. And this was shown in the paper here, where they showed a subepicardial uh, LGE in the mid-inferior and infraroceptal walls with corresponding elevation in native T1 and T2 times. And this, uh, talking about cardiac sarcoidosis, this was really an incredible state-of-the-art review written by our very own Dr. Trivieri and Jack in 2020. And we've already talked about kind of the diagnostic criteria and, and the way that we approach diagnosis. So I'll skip over this. But just to say, there's no specific pattern on LGE, uh, no specific pattern of LGE on CMR that is diagnostic for CS, although it is usually patchy, multifocal, sparing of the endocardial border. And most commonly, as Dr. Liao mentioned, you see it in the basal segments, particularly the septum and the lateral wall. Transmural involvement can occur, as we see in this patient, and uh, the RV free wall may also be involved in some cases. And here is the picture that Dr. Trivieri was talking about. This is from her paper. 
you know, PET-MR enables concurrent imaging of the two stages of disease, both the inflammation and the fibrosis and scar portion. And what we see here is what Dr. Trevier was talking about, that pathognomonic hug sign that you see on PET-MR uh, in cardiac sarcoid, where you have areas of LGE in the RV and basal septum with matching increased FDG signal. So uh, as per Dr. Trivier's paper and Dr. Trivier is sitting in the room with us right now, that is pathognomonic for CS. And then we also talked about kind of the treatment algorithm and you know, starting off with steroids and then guiding uh, treatment based on imaging. And we already kind of talked about that. So I'll get back to our patient. Uh, the patient had an ICD placed before discharge. After discharge, the patient followed up with heart failure here at Mount Sinai. The patient was started on steroids without recurrent arrhythmia on April 28th and was referred to Dr. Morgenthau, who is our resident sarcoid expert here at Mount Sinai. The patient had a repeat echo around three months later uh, and on July 25th, and really no change on this echo, which is pretty interesting. You can see the LVEF is 34% here, really pretty much unchanged. So the patient was then, as Dr. Trivieri mentioned, started on uh, methotrexate, and they actually started to taper down the steroids, but then the patient developed VFib and complete heart block as they tried to down titrate the, as they tried to taper the steroids. And this was in uh, September of 2022. So then they re-up titrated the steroids at that point. And then as Dr. Liao mentioned, the patient underwent a PET-CT um, in, uh, in basically earlier this month. And what did that PET-CT show? Well, interestingly, uh, they, they showed this myocardial scar from cardiac sarcoid with no active myocardial inflammation or scarring from another etiology. And interestingly, they got an LVEF here of 58%. Um, and then they said overall, cardiac sarcoid is probable 50 to 90%. And then in terms of extra cardiac PET-CT findings, they saw no definite evidence of FDG avid systemic sarcoidosis. So, and one thing. Terrific. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say, since we're low on time, uh, thank, I think that ends the presentation, right? So I'll yes. ask the panelists if they have any final comments. No, I mean, the comment that I wanted to say is that SCAR and the way you see it on PET-CT is not SCAR the way you see on MR, because that essentially is where you don't have uh, FDG uptake. Uh, you know, um, unless they've done some uh, assessment of myocardial structure, which probably they did. Any other comments, closing comments from our panel here? Dr. Kukar? Um, no, I think it's a fantastic case. I think PET MRI is beautiful imaging and definitely the way of the future. And we are definitely very lucky um, to have it there. And I think as Dr. Trivieri mentioned, just being able to evaluate for, you know, hyalur adenopathy and, and uptake in the extracardiac structures instead of the rather rare diagnosis of isolated cardiac sarcoid um, can really help um, kind of cinch the diagnosis. Thank you. We had some questions come in online, but uh, I think they've all been answered by the panelists. So if there's nothing burning from the audience, I think we'll close here. I'll thank you so much to the panelists. Jo uh, Saul, fantastic job preparing this really interesting case. Also, please join us this afternoon, 5 p.m., Controversies in Cardiology. Dr. Ritker will be here. Dr. Bott is moderating. Dr. Fuster is on the panel. Should be a fantastic discussion, so we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.